So here's kind of what's going on in Nehemiah. Nehemiah has left the area of Persia, and he is going into Israel. And in Israel, he is rebuilding the walls, okay? And so this is the project that Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, is helping to, is really funding all his own. It's a great act of God using history and all the events that took place in history for this to take place. It's just a miracle, and it's amazing. So Israel's being rebuilt. The walls are being rebuilt. It's all coming going well until enemies start showing up and attacking and Nehemiah is dealing with having to not only build the walls but also deal with a discouraged people also deal with true death threat scenarios so he's needing to set up a Jack Bauer type ministry he's needing to get himself a, a little bit of of Reese agents and whatever else he can get to try to get protection and safety and security so that they can get this project done and it's amazing whenever a church or a group of God's people try to get together to do God's work, there is always opposition somewhere. Sometimes it's in a form of people wanting to have a completely alternate goal, a completely alternate agenda, and they want to shut down the work of God. Sometimes it is situations and circumstances, and as we like to call it, the mess of life, that saps our energy, our time, our resources, and drains us in such a way that we just feel like giving up. Okay, so we have many oppositions that come our way. Okay, so Nehemiah is continuing forward. The battle is there. He has guards set up. People are working with weapons on their hip. Some people are working one-handed with a weapon in one hand, and then they're carrying stuff with the other, and they're going at this project in the name of God, because that's what they're working through. And what we're going to find out is in this last part of chapter 5, as Nehemiah is trying to structure things and develop things, he, is finding, he has found out last week that the nobles had taken advantage of the poor people, that there was a famine in the land, and people were selling their kids into slavery and into uh, financial servitude in order to make up for that type of deficit and debt, and they're losing their lands. Things are getting foreclosed upon, and what the nobles are doing is that they are increasingly adding interest to the, the loans, to the uh, bailouts, if you will. They're saying, we'll give you this, we'll take your land, we'll take your servitude, but we're also going to increase interest on you. It's going to be at a higher rate. So all the money that they were giving the nobles was less than what they are able to have as their debt is increasing. So their income is less than their expenses. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And so Nehemiah confronted the nobles. And he told them what you guys are doing is, is sure, it might be considered legal, but it is not ethical, it is not moral, and it is not pleasing to God. Please return all slaves back to their families. Please return all land back to the families. And go ahead and all the interest you've been collecting, cancel that, cancel the debt, and return some of the added interest back to the families. And the nobles said, we fear God, we will follow you, Nehemiah, and they did that. Okay, they did that. I mean, this is phenomenal. Could you imagine a pastor one day telling banks that they have hiked up their interest at an un inappropriate rate and to please go ahead and cancel the debt, return the homes to people, make it debt free and refund some of that extra interest and the bank's going, okay, pastor. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> okay, that's what happened last week. It was phenomenal. It was extraordinary. Okay, it was extraordinary. Now this is a continuation of that. So verse 14. Furthermore, this is Nehemiah still writing. It's like a memoir or a journal. As Nehemiah is living this event, he is taking notes and writing this all down. Furthermore, from the day King Artaxerxes appointed me to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until his 32nd year, 12 years, this is interesting, when Nehemiah told Artaxerxes, hey, I want to go and rebuild the walls, Artaxerxes says, well, how long? And he said, an appointed period of time. And Artaxerxes was good with that. How long was that time ended up being? At least 12 years. Okay. Wow. We're going to come back to that. That's impressive. So for 12 years, I and my associates never ate from the food allotted to the governor. Okay. Nehemiah is the governor, and he is allotted by law an income from the city, okay, through taxes, through whatever. He is allowed food from the city, a type of income, and he is saying he has been working for free. How many of you could go 12 years without a paycheck? 
Okay, most of us can't go 12 days, <laughs> right? You know, you go 12 days out of paycheck, you get that unpaid time off or sick leave. If you're paid hourly, you're like, oh man, this is going to be a horrible month. I don't know how ends are going to meet. This is terrible. Okay, Nehemiah went 12 years. Okay, the, verse 15, the governors who's preceded me had heavily burdened the people, taking food and wine from them as well as a pound of silver. Their subordinates also oppressed the people, but I did not do this because of the fear of God. Instead, I devoted myself to the construction of the wall, and all my subordinates were gathered there for the work, and we did not buy any land. Okay, so this is absolutely amazing that Nehemiah says, I'm governor. I have, I live off of what I get. This is how governments work, right? It's not like governments are out selling Girl Scout cookies. Governments get paid by the taxes of the people. That's where the money comes from. You want, a, want better military? You got to pay the taxes to afford the military. You want protection? You want better paved roads? Then you got to raise the taxes or at least pay taxes to get the money to afford to do that. That's just how things work. You know, and churches understand this. At least they should because churches don't go around selling Girl Scout cookies either. All right, churches get money because of tithes. That's where the churches get fun from. That's where we pay for our rent, where we pay for our le electricity and our utilities. This is where churches pay for their equipment and their advertising. This is where churches pay for their resources and pay for teaching and pay for anything that we do in materials. We have to get money from somewhere, okay? And that comes from tithing. So we, so we get this. We understand this. And Nehemiah says, this is legal. This is appropriate. This is how things work, that you get taxes, you get it from the people, a portion of it, and this funds thing. This allows things to work. And Nehemiah said, I did not take a thing. I didn't take a kernel. I didn't take a seed. I didn't take a penny or a single drop of silver. I took nothing. Could you imagine that? What would happen to our government if our government decided to say, we're canceling taxes 100% across the board? I know, some people be like, woohoo! <laughs> and then all our military gets laid off because there's no paychecks for them. A lot of housing projects shut down. A lot of the projects that fun, help fund for poor people shut down. All the schools shut down. They get governmental aid. And I think we would have a real problem. But somehow, Nehemiah was able to get this to work. Why? Because who's funding this whole expedition? King Artaxerxes, okay? Bill Gates on steroids. That's who's funding this whole thing. King Artaxerxes had billions of dollars, and back in the day, that was like quadruple trillions into the Googles, if you will, okay? King Artaxerxes is one of the wealthiest people in the history of the world. Not the wealthiest, but one of the wealthiest people in the history of the world. The and Persian Empire was horribly wealthy, and so King Artaxerxes is, Nehemiah went to him and said, King Artaxerxes, I'd like you, I'd like to go and have you change. I know you said stop building in Israel. You stopped the whole project before when Ezra was there. I want you to change your foreign policy and I want you to send me to do it and I want you to pay for every single piece of construction and pay for my home and my income. And I want you to pay for, and I'm going to be gone 12 years, paid vacation. <laughs> and Artaxerxes said yes to this. Okay, this is the astonishment of this. This is the amazing part of this. And so here's Artaxerxes sending cows and oxen and sheep and everything and wood and resources and stone and everything being sent to Israel. And Nehemiah is doing this and he's working at it. And this does bring us to an interesting principle, though, that needs to be understood. That principle for doing ministry, that's what these principles are about. How to do ministry, what's involved in doing ministry. Principle to learn, number one, that we can grasp and glean from this, is that ministry will involve sacrifice often up front. Ministry will involve sacrifice often up front. For the work of God to be done, there's got to be sacrifice. And I'm talking, yes, Jesus paid the sacrifice. That's the sin debt. That's the forgiveness of sin. But to do the Great Commission, 
to proclaim the good news of Christ and the good news of the kingdom of Christ and the restoration of shalom, to do all of that requires sacrifice often up front. Okay, Nehemiah did not take food from the people. He did sacrificing up front. Income came from the Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes, to allow this ministry to take place, this mission to go forward, does a sacrifice up front. It takes sacrifice to start a ministry. It just does. If you're going to start a ministry, it's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of time. It's going to take all your resources, and it's going to be difficult, especially especially from the start. I'll never forget when I first started being the pastor here. And I was a full-time pastor and one of the lowest paid Southern Baptist pastors in the state, if not our whole region. Okay, it was a hard sacrificial time. It was. I had to do that sacrifice up front until eventually I was able to get paid more. And I thank you for that. I'm no longer the lowest paid. <laughs> and, and, and I appreciate that. <laughs> You know, but it, there's that sacrifice that's there up front. Uh, I was allotted amongst my salary what was called resource reimbursement. That if I were to buy commentaries and journals and things like that for research, the church would reimburse me certain funds for that. I never handed in a single receipt and still haven't for a single book that I have bought. I've never handed in anything for reimbursement for any of my materials. I was told that, hey, you know, maybe it's possible the church could replace your laptop since you use it for church more than anything else. Not handing in my receipt. Bought a new one, even outside of my budget, in order to help our ministry do better. And I'm not asking for anything from that. Why? Because ministry takes sacrifice. Okay? And I, I'm trying to not just let it be words. I'm trying to display it to show you it's what it takes. Okay, ministry takes that sacrifice absolutely up front. Now, is Nehemiah in his right to collect taxes? Yes. Okay, so which means then that sacrifice sometimes means you give up something that is legally appropriate for you. Sometimes that sacrificing means you have to give up a right of yours. Well, it's my right. You're right. It is your right. It doesn't mean you have to collect it. It doesn't mean you have to exercise it. Sometimes that sacrifice means you give up stuff that is legally yours. Would have been totally appropriate for me to hand in some receipts for reimbursement of some of the materials that I do to help our ministry thrive. Yes, but we're also struggling. We're also struggling. And so it might be legally right, but I wouldn't necessarily call it theologically right. That yes, it would be totally appropriate and, and, and totally correct to do. And at the same time, I think God would be more pleased at the sacrifice rather than exercising a right. And so we have to kind of keep that in mind that is going to involve sacrifice. And we got, we're, we're trying to start new as a new ministry. And what's that going to take, not just from me, but from all of us? It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take sacrifice of time, sacrifices of resources, whatever those may be. It's going to take sacrifice from all of us. Now, is it our right to stay at home and to watch NCIS? Yes, it's our right. Especially since they got a new lady replacing Ziva David, and she's quirky and fun. <laughs> and so it's especially your right. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have to exercise it all the time. Sometimes sacrifice might be necessary. We talked last week that it is your right to buy Coke, a cola. <laughs> <laughs> Always have to be careful with that soda drink. Okay, that it is your right to buy Coca-Cola and to drink as much as you want. You know, it, it really is your legal right. But maybe you could sacrifice some of that. Two bottles a week was about three bucks. And then three bucks a week would really come go a long way in a struggling church, especially if everybody did that. And they found a place where they could cut back just a little bit, just to give just something, just something, so that the funds would be there to allow the ministry to continue. It's a sacrificing up front. And that's what it's going to take for the ministry to continue. And if you were to look at the life of Jesus, I think you would find something very similar. That he did not be, he did not go and work at some job to 
afford and to give him the money to do many things. He went and was doing sacrifice up front. Okay, that, that, that's how it works. You do sacrifice up front. And then another thing we end up realizing is that Nehemiah was sacrificing up front, but for how long? At least 12 years, okay? Which brings us to principle number two, that ministry needs time, and you got to be in it for the long haul. Ministry needs time, and there is going to be, amongst that time, ups and downs. It is never a straight, linear progression. The only thing that is linear about ministry is that it goes forward. That is it, <laughs> okay? That the calendar keeps slipping away. That is the only thing that is, that is guaranteed within ministry. It always is going to have, amongst that line, going forever forward, these ups and downs. And often up front, because of the sacrifices that are necessary, it's down and negative more than it's positive. You find more negative experiences. You find more that you're exhausted. You find more that, that there's a lack of momentum. You find more that, man, you start having thoughts. Where are the people? Why don't they care? Why are things struggling? Why are, why are some people going and other people staying? What's going on with this ups and downs of this ministry? It's because ministry needs time to try to rebuild what needs to be effective. Did you know that it takes a minimum, minimum, of seven years for a ministry to even get properly founded. It takes a minimum of seven years for a ministry to even get properly, even beginning to be founded. Usually it, the number is really from seven to 11 years. I always love that figure because it reminds me of where I can get cool little Slurpees. Okay, and, and I'm waiting for them to get banana flavored back. <laughs> My wife told me about banana flavored Slurpees, and, and that sounds glorious. It really does. Okay, but it takes seven to 11 years to properly lay down the works of a ministry. Why so long? Because you got to weed out the people who don't belong. You got to do that. You got to weed out the people that don't belong. Because in every ministry, you got a collection of people, and not every person is going to be beneficial for the ministry. You notice that Jesus did not have just a big army of disciples. He had people that were working for him, but how many did he really select for the ministry? Twelve. Okay, twelve. And even amongst those twelves, you can, feel you can still find a saboteur. Okay, people that, and what it looks like in the church today would be people that they just talk negatively about the church and they just trash talk people and they're always trying to find some reason why it's not where it's supposed to be and they always like to always throw out that negative ball of wax and it's just, that can be a type of saboteur. And we gotta, it takes time to weed through all of that and to be able to get a, a strong, healthy body that is able to trust and sacrifice together and to try to instill hope together, that there's future together. Yes, things are down here, but that's not what we're focusing on. Who cares that we're down here? We're focusing on what Jesus is going to be doing with the ministry, and that one day it's not going to be here. It's going to be someplace else, and we're going to keep moving forward and keep marching on, because we are an instrument of Christ, and we're going to keep fighting whatever it may take. And that instills hope. And that's what we need to do. People are leaving. Okay, fine. They're leaving. We try to find out and learn the best that we can. And every person that has left this church, I have talked to all of them. And I know all the reasons people are leaving. I know all of what is going on. And I've talked with the council. Most of it are things that we cannot change. Most of it are things that we cannot change. And there's nothing we can do about it. So why go into the despair and dump saying, woe is us? Let's say, fine, that's another thing. We got to get the right people in the right bus and the right seat so that our bus can go to its destination and be effective. And that's what we're working on. And we're getting there. And it's going to take time. It's going to take time. And I'm excited because as it takes seven to 11 years to be able to even just lay the beginnings of the foundation of ministry. And I'm in the toward the first quarter of my 10th year. And I'm like, yay, I'm almost there. And yes, the foundation's been laid. And I know this, that to be true. <laughs> and it took 10 hard years of sacrifice. There was even a point where we were really struggling. And my wife and I, we took a 50% roughly pay cut from the church so that the church could have more money to be able to last and do more things to give us more time to get things in order. And it took a lot of sacrifice because I knew that it took time. 
and we had to be in it for the long haul together. Here's what's amazing about American statistics regarding ministry. You know what the average length of stay is for a youth pastor? One year. The average for the United States of America as a whole, the average length of stay for a youth pastor or a youth director is one year. The average length of stay for a pastor of a church is three years. Okay? Which means that what's happening is that as ministry falls apart, as it always does, it's always below the positive line into the negative. It's there a lot. As those rough times hit, people are jumping ship. They see that some people are leaving, and they use the phrase, well, rats always follow the rats when the ship is on water. Well, guess what? The church is not a ship, and the people are not rats. Okay? <laughs> they may act like it, but they're not. Okay, just because people are leaving does not mean that that's a sign that there's a reason to leave. Okay? Weeds leave a garden. Right? If there's a skunk in my yard, someone's leaving. <laughs> it's, just, it's just what happens, okay? It just, it, there's, there's. <laughs> That's an odd metaphor, depending on how you want to twist that one. <laughs> okay? It, it takes time to deal with it. It really, really does. And so many people, when the going gets rough, they leave. They give up and they quit and they try to find something that's already established, that's already been past that 11-year hump, that already has gotten what it needs to do. And after that 11-year hump, they then look for a church that's been past that 20-year hump to be able to really get itself moving onward. And that's what they keep looking for. And really, it's almost like people are looking for a mall. I just want to know that I can go to a place where it just has everything that I already need and I don't have to be a contributor. And where we're at right now is at ground zero, asking for contributors. People to not just attend, but people to actually be carrying, metaphorically, stones and rebuilding the spiritual walls of this city and rebuilding the spiritual lives of this city that is broken and desecrated and devastated. And we have the opportunity to be workers, not just observers. That's what it means to be where we are. Yes, it's negative. Yes, it's going to take time. Yes, it's going to take sacrifice. But we get to be workers. We get to be like those Jews building the wall and going at it from ground zero and building up and restoring. That's, what, that's the uniqueness of where we're at. Yes, if you want to not work, go someplace that's already been doing that and the walls have already been built in that area and whatever. But if you want to really experience something unique, something that is more than just standing on the shoulders of people and just reaching for whatever, if you really want to get to real hardcore work and ministry and get to where the actual grime and grut meet, this is the place to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is the place to be, because this is where work is going to be happening. That's why a lot of people love church starts. That's why church plants are so popular within Southern Baptist circles, because that's the building of the wall, not just standing with a lawn chair on top of an already built one. What good is a lawn chair sipping a Coke? Yeah, that's nice. I like being down and having more purpose than that. I like being able to look at my hands and sp see spiritual calluses forming on my fingertips, knowing that it was a hard day's well-served work. And it's for God's glory. That's what I want to see. And we can all be part of that if we can be in for the absolute long haul. So here's what Nehemiah does as this continues onward. He says that he is sacrificing up front. He gives and pushes aside what is legally potentially his, and he doesn't take advantage of that. He doesn't go that route, and he's in it for the long haul, 12 years. I don't know how many of you would be willing to, if someone told you, hey, would you like to do this? Sure. How, what does it take? Well, it takes 12 years. No. I, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, counseling from time to time with people, and, and they'll tell me, they said, I need career advice. Okay, cool, what do you want, what do you want to do? And they say, well, I want something that doesn't require a lot of schooling. <laughs> well, then you're not in it for the long haul. You know, what would you like to do? I, I would love to be a psychologist or a college professor. 
going to need a lot of schooling for that, but <laughs> you know, I would love to be a physical therapist. Well, that's a minimum of four years, maybe five right there. Well, I don't want that much schooling. <laughs> McDonald's is hiring. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you know you, you, you <laughs> I, I teach at, at, a, uh, at a college, and I have students that are working on their associate's degree, and I've told some of them, I said, man, I see real potential, you could go on to seminary and get your master's. And they're like, how many more years of schooling is that? I said, well, you're in your associate's, like your second year, you need to finish your bachelor's, that's going to be four, maybe five, not an additional, but a total of four or five. You got maybe one and a half done, so that means you got about three and a half more to go, and then seminary is about four years full-time, depending on your degree, so that would give you about maybe, what, that, like seven years, and they're like, I am not going to school that long. I'm like, if you want to do the most effective work of ministry, you'll want it. That's what it's going to take, the long Hall. But many people, they see that length of time and they give up. Nehemiah does not. He knows up front, King Artaxerxes, this is a decade plus in the making. And I'm in it for the long haul. The long haul. Okay, so now here's what Nehemiah does during that time period. Verses 17 through 18. There were 150 Jews and officials as well as guests from the surrounding nations at my table each day. One ox, six choice sheep, and some fowl were prepared for me, and an abundance of all kinds of wine were provided every 10 days. But I did not demand the food allotted to the governor because the burden on the people was so heavy. Because the burden on the people was so heavy. How many people came to Nehemiah's house? Hundreds. 150s was counted plus an additional more, a countless more, okay? So he said there's 150 as well as guests from the surrounding nations. Who knows how many that was? It was just too many to count. Could have been dozens, could have been hundreds. We don't know. What we do know is this. Let's say it was just 50 <laughs> from the surrounding nations. What does that make that number? 200. Now, can you have 200 people at your home? <laughs> okay, you, you get this. Here, here's just the reality of this. And how often did Nehemiah have people at his house? Every day. Every day. It doesn't mean that all 200 was there every day. And it, but it meant there was a large crowd at his house every day. 20 people this day, 100 people that day. Maybe there was a day where 200 people were there. And there might have been 50 and 75 and 130. But every day he had people at his house. So much so that he had to restock his entire wine supply every 10 days. Which means, you know, these people were having a good time. <laughs> okay. It was Super Bowl Sunday every day. Okay. Now, this would then require that Nehemiah has what? A very big home. That's what this requires, that Nehemiah has a very big home and has to have lots of income. Because if he's not collecting taxes and he's not collecting money from the food from the people, how is he affording all these oxen every day, 365 days a year? That's 300, and it's all from the king again, okay? This is where it's coming from, and that's awesome, okay? But this is expensive, horribly expensive, Okay, and so what he's doing is Nehemiah having all these people, and he's got to have a big home. He's got to have a big home. Either that or everybody coming by as part of the Lollipop Guild. You know, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for one, thank you. <laughs> they're all itty-bitty people, okay? <laughs> but they're not all itty-bitty people. <laughs> they're not all munchkins from Oz. They're, they're people, like, like you and I. They're, they're five-foot, six-foot people, okay? And, and not all of them or like me. Okay, some of them are going to take up their fair share of space. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's going to be crowded. And here's what I find fascinating. People in our culture today really look down upon the pastor who owns a big house. They look down upon pastors who own the biggest house in the neighborhood. They look down upon, I've even had some people tell me, I do not respect a pastor who makes more than $100,000 a year. I do not respect that. I think any pastor that gets paid that much is horrible. I make nowhere near that, so don't think I'm defending myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nowhere even close, okay? Even with the extra jobs that I do, don't even match up to even getting close at all. So don't th I'm not defending myself here, okay? Not at all. I just want that to be clear. 
Okay? But they say, I do not respect a pastor that makes over 100000 a year. Well, here's the reality of it. Let's say you're a pastor of a church of 2,000 people. That's just, just that number, because that, that's, that's actually not uncommon in our area. We're a very unique area around here. We have more um, mega churches per capita than almost any state in our country. It is quite amazing, actually. Even more than Dallas, Texas. Okay, because Dallas, Texas has three times the people and the same number of mega churches. So think about that. Okay, so we are, we are very unique in this area that we have churches that are over five, we have dozens of churches that are over 5,000 in regular weekly attendance. We have a couple churches that are over 10,000 in weekly attendance. Okay, we just, we're, it's very unique. Now, let's say that you're a pastor of a church of 2,000 people, and you were to visit two families every single day of the week, never taking a day off or anything. How many would you get done in a year? 700 people, 800 people, Right? That's all you're going to get, that many families. That's it. And you got thousands. So how in the world are you going to try to minister? I mean, that means going a whole year without ever seeing somebody. Because we got that many people in an auditorium, what are you going to get? Any type of real contact with some of them? No. So how are you going to do this? By inviting people over to your house 50, 75 at a time. Okay, from anywhere from 30 to 75 at a time. Inviting people over to your home. Because in all reality, principle number three is that due to ministry demands, people need to eat in groups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's just fact. <laughs> you will not see that published anywhere, by the way. <laughs> but it is true, isn't it? Because a pastor can only be so many places at a time. And so you got to bring people over. And you got to invite people to the house. Now, you, that means you got to have a house big enough to support 50, 75 people, even 30. The house my wife and I live in can support about 20. And that's really pushing it. Okay, that's really pushing it. In the summertime, we can put more because we can just put people outside as long as it's not raining. And if we have more than 20, it's your outside anyway. Enjoy. <laughs> we'll open our garage. <laughs> you can fit five in there right now. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, you need a place big enough to be able to minister to that many people. Now, in our society, how expensive of a house is that? Right? Okay, if you want a house that can entertain 50 to 75 people, you are looking at $175,000 to $200,000 home at least. And if you're going to afford that type of mortgage payment, what type of income do you need? So the pastors that are paid over 100000 a year, my heart and hat goes off to them because the more they receive, the more they can give back. I just pray that they're doing that, that they're using that money to get the house that is able to entertain and then paying for the food so that they're not paying admission to their house. <laughs> right? <laughs> Could you imagine that? Uh, could you imagine if I went, hey, people of Anchor, you're all welcome to come over to our house and bring 10 bucks each of you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How welcoming is that? <laughs> you know? When we invite people over, it's free. And we provide the food. If you want to bring food with you, knock yourself out. But we provide the food. That's usually what we do. And it costs us. Just for our, I wish when 20 people show up, it costs my wife and I about 200 bucks. When it's all said and done, at least 150 just for the meat and the drinks and everything else and decorations and the utilities as increased and the water flow because you guys have small bladders. I don't know where you come from, you know, but, but, it, but it happens and the toilet paper and, and the, the paper plates and the dishwasher and all the, the stove and, and everything, okay? And if we have anything outside and we look at sometimes we talk about renting a tent, you, you, you get the point. It's expensive, Okay, and if you're going to do this every day, or at least every week, you got to have the income for it. You got to have it. Okay, and, and it just because of ministry demands, if we're really going to get to know people, we need to do it in, in groups. That's just how it's going to be. And let me also point out ministry principle number four. This is just 
as weird as it is, like number three, it's 100% true. Eating at someone's home is hospitable. Eating at a hall or restaurant is not. It's an event. Okay, eating at a home is hospitality. Eating out at a restaurant is not. Okay, and, and hospitality is something that is so essential. This is what Nehemiah is really displaying when he's inviting people over to his home. I got to experience the difference of this during my doctoral program. When I was at, uh, my wife and I, we went, sometimes when I would go down for my seminars in Kentucky, my wife would come with me. And uh, especially when before we had kids, she'd come with me more often. And then when we had kids, we found that was a, a lot more difficult. We still did it, but it was, it was a lot more difficult. Um, the last time we brought our, our daughter, well, Rachel, I think you were so pregnant with George at the time, or just barely so, it was a really good visit. Ziva loved the campus. But here's the thing. We got down there, one of my first classes, Dr. Pettigrew was my professor. I will never forget this. He invited our entire class to his house, and we had class at his house. All our spouses were encouraged to come along. And what happened was, was all the people in the class, we were predominantly male, which was interesting. We only had like one or two girls in our class, of the 15 in my class. And so we all showed up at his house, and my wife came with me to, to his house, and we're there. And his wife, first he provided food for everybody, and then his wife took all the spouses from the class to a separate room, and they had their own time of talking and sharing a type of devotional together while we were having class in a whole separate room. It was amazing. I loved it. I left there going, man, Dr. Pettigrew's older than Methuselah, and he's awesome. <laughs> he was an old, old man, okay? He had wrinkles in places I don't have places. I mean, this guy was old, and he was so hospitable, that I came into his home, and his wife and him, they were smiling, and they greeted us, and, and they allowed us to make the, our, ourselves at home. It was literally, make yourselves at home. And we were able to sit there and have class and sit on the sofa. He's like, are you thirsty? I'm like, what do you got for soda? He's like, I, I, he named off a bunch. I'm, I, I'll take that. And he's bringing stuff out. It was phenomenal. And then my wife was so encouraged because in their little group, but they're talking, they're talking about how someone in the group had had a miscarriage and they didn't know how to, or some, their relative had a miscarriage, they didn't know how to deal with that. My wife had had one and so she's helping them all through that. It was a great time of ministry for all of them at the same time, all within a home. Now, we got done with that, great experience. All my other professors for the rest of my doctoral career brought our whole class to restaurants. We went to this pizza place or that Chinese place or whatever the case may be. It was nice. We got to have chit-chat. We got to talk. It was fun. Nothing like being at the house. Nothing like it. One, you're in an environment that's very, very neutral, and you're looking around. You see other people and other tables, and you're at this, and you get a waiter and whatever. And Sure, it was nice. We got to chat and have a good time, but there is something profoundly special about going to Dr. Pettigrew's home. In my master's program, I had one professor invite me to his house. I went over there, met his wife, met his kids, and we had a great time. And, and I remember that moment more than I remember anything for any of my other professors because it was hospitality. Okay, it was hospitality. And if you're going to be doing ministry, you got to be hospitable. And to be hospitable literally means that you, and this is how Martin Luther defined hospitality. He based it off the theology of the cross and he added one little part to it. And it sounds like this, where you sacrifice yourself to help other people flourish within the environment you have provided for them. And you know who is the best at hospitality? God. Because you know what God did in the beginning of Genesis? He created everything. Why did he create humans last because he was being a hospitable God. He sacrificed himself to provide the entire environment that was necessary for humanity to flourish, and then he put humanity into it. Okay, that's what, that's what hospitality is. Come into my home. You are, you are the guest here. I'm gonna do everything I can to help you flourish here. What do you want? I will get it. What do you need? I will provide it. What would you like? I'll see if I can get it. I, it is, I am here to help you flourish in life. And that's hospitality. And in all reality, here's the kicker about hospitality. It is strongly implied when we look through the Old Testament and New Testament that hospitality is not viewed 
as hospitality unless you're doing it to somebody that is not your relative. If your sister comes over and you are very hospitable, you are not showing hospitality. You are being a godly sister. If your parents come over and you provide everything for them and help them flourish, you're not being hospitable, you're being godly children. If your children come and visit, you're being godly parents. You you get how this works. But when somebody who is not your relative comes over, now you're being hospitable. Okay, that's how it is, is shown within Scripture, like with Nehemiah. Who is it that's coming over? Is it just his brothers and sisters? No. Even people from other nations are coming over. See, it's hospitality. That's what he's showing here. And so that's the question for us to be able to ask ourselves, is how is your hospitality? How are you at getting people to be able to be provided for in your place as an environment you provide for someone? Are you being hospitable? Are you even inviting people over at all? Surely, legally, you don't have to. You don't. I can't sit here and say, it's the law, you have to invite people over. Not going to do that, because legally, you don't have to. If you rent the place, if you own a place, if you're in mortgage at a place, whatever the case may be, legally you do not have to. But theologically, that place is not yours. That place is God's. Even though you're renting it from a company, even if a bank owns it, even if you paid off all your debts and you say, I I put all my money into it, now I own it, theologically it is God's. He provided everything necessary for you to be able to afford it and to have it and to have it provided and whatever, And how are you serving him with it? Are you serving him with your home? And one of the ways to serve him with your home is inviting people over. In fact, on April 6th, I'm looking forward because Rachel and I are having a lot of people over to our home for a WrestleMania event. (laughs) I am looking forward to the WrestleMania event. I am looking forward to The Undertaker going undefeated once again. I am looking forward to some great, I am looking forward to John Cena. (laughs) One of the guys coming over hates John Cena, so I'm going to purposely root for him. (laughs) Just to make things interesting. I want to help him thrive, you know, and flourish in our environment. (laughs) Okay, but this is what my wife and I do. We invite people over. And April 6th is our next big inviting people over for. And we love doing that. We love having people over. Are you doing that? What are you doing? And if it's hard and it's awkward, you don't know where to start, find an event and throw an event at your home and invite people over. Super Bowl, New Year's, Thanksgiving, WrestleMania, Oscars, whatever the case may be. For two years, we used to host our Oscar parties at the church building. For the past two years, we've held it at our house. Love it. It's crammed. It's crammed. It really is. We really pack people in, and and it's a little awkward sometimes. That's one of the reasons why my wife and I have our house for sale, so that we could eventually be able to sell that house and then see where ministry is going and buy a house that will better meet the needs so that we can have people over. Because when we bought our house originally, we went, okay, hmm, what do we need to be able to serve? We need a, a, a gathering room, a game room, and then we need bedrooms for potential kids. We hadn't had kids yet. And, and we bought a house that was perfect for all of that. And then something happened. We, we had two kids. We planned for that. We did not plan for how ev- things of children spill out of their rooms. <laughs> We were naive, you know, and we did not know it was going to spill out and, and vomit over our whole entire house. We had no idea that we needed a play space outside of the rooms for the kids. We, we had no idea. Uh, we, we had it set up, but we didn't realize how much it needed to actually encompass, you know. <laughs> and, and then we also ended up selling our church building. That meant my office had to go home, which there is no space for. There was until we had a second child. And so now we're like, okay, so right now my office is in the playroom. <laughs> It's very, very fun when you got all your theological books open and a laptop open, and there's a daughter putting babies in toilets. <laughs> Play toilets, not the real thing. <laughs> and she's going, help, baby's in the toilet. Oh, I can't help you, I'm in the oven. And, it, <laughs> and I'm trying to work, and I'm going, I got to see this. <laughs> I just got to see this unfold. You know? and, and so it, it's difficult. So we're going to make sure that when we buy our next house, 
that we're gonna make sure that there's a bedroom for each of our children, that the bedrooms are big enough, that should we have a third child that we can bunk up, the, the two of the same gender in the same room. And we're gonna make sure that there's a play space for them. And when other kids come over, it's a big enough play space that they have a place to hang out so the children are not an inconvenience, they're a blessing and they belong. And we're gonna make sure that there's an additional room or a den of which I can go and get some work done. And, and, and so we're gonna make sure that we have a yard with a swing set that kids can play in and a place where we can play games outside. And we're gonna make sure we got all of these things at our, at our next place. And so this is what we're doing because we think ministry. We think hospitality, and we organize our lives around that. That's what, we're, that's what we're all about. And I encourage you to do the same to the best of your ability. Look around at what you got. Look at everything that you have in your possession and ask yourselves, how can I use this to serve God and to serve people? How can I rework this and organize this that I could be able to have hospitality and show hospitality, help people flourish and honor God all at the same time? Because it is possible. It just takes some well, creativity. <laughs> it really, really does. And so we look at all that Nehemiah is doing and the four principles that he has been showing us throughout this chapter of chapter, last part of chapter five. And, and I'd like to assess why he does it. I'd like to look at his motivation, which we find not only in verse 19, but also back in 15. Because if you back up a little bit to verse 15. Nehemiah says that the governors who before him had burdened the people, and you look down toward the end of the verse, I did not burden the people, I did not take land, I did not acquire land at, at, at someone else's expense because they couldn't afford it, and then got it at a low cost, and relevated the market, and then sold it at a high profit. I did not do anything like that because of the fear of God. Okay, because of the fear of God, which means that ne Nehemiah's motives were religiously theological. Nehemiah did not act the way he did to try to earn salvation, because salvation cannot be earned. He wasn't doing this hoping that he would somehow find entrance into heaven. Morality and ethics will not get you there. Impossible. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, salvation's identical. Salvation comes from the grace of God alone, and it's through faith in him, period. It's the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Salvation works identical. And that's one of the great things about Jesus, that his sacrifice covered all sins for all time. So it backs all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. So anyone who had faith in God was able to be saved by God's grace because of Christ, regardless of what year Christ was sacrificed in. Because of how his sacrifice was. It was an eternal sacrifice for all sins. And so salvation is the same. By faith, through the grace of God. Okay, so it was not to earn salvation. Nehemiah did not do it because he was a charitable guy. He wasn't interested in charity because it wasn't just poor Jews at his table. It was nobles and officials, even from other lands at his table. So it wasn't just a charity thing for him. And he's not just some guy trying to get Mr. Universe or something like that and being some type of humanitarian award. He is doing this out of fear of God. And this is a fear that is not that all reverent type of fear. It is fear that I want to make sure that I am obeying my God completely because I fear his wrath. I respect God like I respect a gun. And I will be fear of God if that gun's ever pointed at me. And so I respect God and I'm afraid of his wrath. I do not, it's like a child to his parent that as soon as the parent goes, one, oh, I've got to behave. Now, my wife and I, we don't count for our daughter because if I have to say one, she's already disobeying. I don't think that two wrongs makes a right. So I don't go one, two, now you're in trouble. No, you're in trouble if I have to say one. I asked you to do it and you didn't do it. You're in trouble. That's uh, just how we are. And, that, and, and, and when Ziva knows that I'm in trouble, she cries and she's upset and, and, and she, she pouts. And, and it's really sad because she's adorable when she does it. <laughs> okay, but when a child knows they're in trouble, Sometimes they will begin to change their behavior to avoid getting in trouble, right? Because that fear of punishment. Nehemiah feared God. It was a reverent fear. Yes, it had reverency to it. It had respect to it. And it had fear of wrath. I fear God, so I am making sure I do not take advantage of people. I'm making sure I do not do things that puts a heavier burden upon people. I make sure that I sacrifice myself to help them flourish. 
I fear God. And then verse 19, the end of chapter 5, is the other reason that Nehemiah does this, the other part of the religious motive. Remember me favorably, my God, for all that I have done for these people or for this people. He wanted God to remember him in favor. Now, this is odd for some of us. We hear this and we go, that almost sounds egotistical. Or it sounds like he's being arrogant. God, I hope you're happy now. And that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Nehemiah is saying, Lord, I am doing this for you. And I hope I'm doing this right. I hope that you look down upon this and you're pleased. I hope you look upon this and you're delighted in what you see. I hope you're not disappointed. I hope that you don't have regret in choosing me to do this job. I hope, God, that when you look upon me, you just feel blessed and are happy all over. Lord, I hope that you are in favorable of what I'm doing. May it be for your honor. May it be for your glory. That's why Nehemiah is doing this. It's not about him to being some great leader and to be in the hall of fame of leadership and to be recognized in the big top 100, whatever. He's not trying to be part of the Fortune 500 or anything like that. Nehemiah is simply out to please his Lord and creator. That's his heart. That's where he's at. God, how can you be satisfied with what I am doing? So that brings us to a couple of concluding questions then. We've already asked some of them. One, how are you at hospitality? Are you inviting people over? Secondly, why are you doing what you are doing? Why, what are you doing with what you've got and why are you doing it? Is it just for selfish gain and agenda because I want to, because it feels good, because I like it, because if I don't do it, I'm going to go out of my mind. You know, or are you doing it because you're trying and hoping that you are pleasing and honoring God and what you are doing? And I know this is incredibly, incredibly hard perspective shift to have. We have to constantly stop our thoughts and control them, redirect them, and change them because it's real easy to say that this is ticking me off. This is depriving me of. It's real easy to go down that road. To be able to step, stop that and say, I'm not going there. I'm stepping back. I'm saying, God, what would be a a you honoring response at this point? What would please you at this moment? How should I respond? I'm frustrated. I'm tired. I get this sometimes when my son wakes up in the middle of the night repeatedly, every hour, like last night. He was up at 11, up at 12, up at 1, up at 140, up at 240, up at 4, up at 440. And I'm just going, Bud, (laughs) can't you at least sleep? You sleep four hours in the afternoon, fine. Can't you sleep at night when I'm trying to sleep? Because I'm going to be exhausted and grumpy and tired. And, and, and then there's other things that can come at us besides exhaustion. Uh, I'm thinking that I actually have developed diabetes. I'm going to be calling my doctors tomorrow and, and setting up an appointment. Because I've had hypoglycemia for a long time. And I know what it feels like for my blood sugar to tank out. And I've been feeling like my blood sugar is out of whack severely, except it's not tanking out. I think it's been elevating. Because things I do to treat my blood sugar drops has been making it worse. And so I'm like, okay, this is going the other direction. And I know that my mom is recently diagnosed, and so no more giving her candy. And, um, <laughs> and my dad has it. And so it seems like that, th- that I might ha- be uh, coming down with this. And, and I know that when your blood sugar gets all screwed up, your thoughts can get crazy and your temperaments can change. And there's so many chemical factors. And still we have to honor and please God. And still it's not an excuse. And it's hard. It's very hard, and we have to work at it, and we have to continue to work at it. And it seems to all root down to two basic things. One, do you really love God to the point that you want to please him in everything you do? And two, do you really love people? Do you really care about people so much that you want them to come over? 
so much that you want to hear their stories, so much that you want to know how things turn out, and that when you pray for them, it's not just so you can have some religious satisfaction of being a godly person, but because you really care for them, and you know God can intervene, and that you're trying to put the two together because you really love God, and you really love and care about and for people. And I'm not talking about people like just family and friends, but people, just people. Do you really care? Those are the two commandments, by the way. When they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And the second one is like it, love people. Love people. Those are the, those are the two commandments. And that's where we got to really assess ourselves. Do we really love God that we want and aim to please him? That so much that we will change everything about us to do it if necessary. That's what we do to our loved ones, by the way. When we want to get married and you're dating someone, you change yourself for them. You finally suddenly like what they like because you, know, you want to be in this for the long haul. You know, when I was uh, dating my wife, and, and she wasn't my wife at the time, we, we still date now that we're married, uh, but when we were dating and I found out things that she liked, I wanted to like it because she liked it. Okay, and I would start changing some of my interests, some of my things, some of my desires. I mean, even now I still do that. She's like, John, I love Downton Abbey. You gotta watch Downton Abbey. And I'm like, I can't quite get through the accents on some of this. It's not as bad as some. Okay, let's watch it. And I'm watching it going, okay, I can, I can. And I'm working on getting into it. I'm getting there. I can appreciate it now. And I like it now. It took me several seasons. And I'm glad they're short seasons. <laughs> 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 you know, and... and you know, but, we, but we change for the people that we love. We do. People say, well, you should never change for someone. Eh, that's baloney. We change for the people we love because we want to be better for them and better with them. And, and we change. And, and so do you change for God? He should be who you love more than anyone. The moment that someone changes away from God for a boyfriend or girlfriend is committing idolatry. Okay, because you got to love God first. You change for him, and you don't change away from him for no one because he is your God and creator. So our, do you love God? And then the second is like it, but not equal to it. Do you love people? So much that you're willing to change your routine to invite them into your home. So much that you're willing to sacrifice your moments of me time to get people to come in. Do you love God and love people? Your whole thing about hospitality boils down to that. Because if you don't love God and people, you will not be hospitable, not in a way that is truly favorable in the eyes of God. You will do it for means to an end rather than to try to just bring God honor and glory and because you love people. Let's have a word of prayer.